Hi, this is Bob Wells here, and welcome to Undercurrent Stories. This is the show where we hear about people's interests and uncover some fascinating stories at the same time. I hope you enjoy today's show. Hello and welcome to Undercurrent Stories. In today's show, I'm really pleased to be joined by Sam Roberts. Sam is a world-renowned expert on ghost signs. He runs tours on ghost signs and is author of the book, Ghost Signs, A London Story. Now, you may well have heard about ghost signs, or you may not have, but one thing I can guarantee is that by the end of the episode, you will be looking out for them wherever you go. Hello and welcome to the show, Sam. Oh, hi, Bob. How are you? Yeah, I'm good, thank you. Great to have you on. Pleasure. Thank you so much. Whereabouts are you based? Uh, I'm in a small town called uh, Ribas, which is just outside of Barcelona in Catalonia slash Spain. But you're originally from London? I am a born and bred Londoner. Yes, that's right. Um, and uh, I'm I'm not one of those that got bored of London, bored of life. But uh, we came over to Spain in 2019 in search of sun and uh, somewhere different to be in, in post-Brexit Britain. Oh, I know what you mean. Well, it's uh, we're, we're, we've had some good weather here today, uh, this this last couple of weeks, but today it's a bit rainy here in uh, South Lincolnshire. Well, we're humid as ever, ever and uh, hotting up, and um, but uh, it's a pleasure to be on air with you, and uh, hopefully I'll cool off with my iced tea in front of me. Very nice, very nice. Now, before we talk about ghost signs, can you just tell us a little bit about yourself, your life's journey, and how you became interested in them, please? Oh, gosh, that's a tough one. Well, the origin really is when I was in London and was working in the advertising industry and became interested in the history of advertising and in particular outdoor advertising and some of the ethical questions about that. And I guess it was connected to when I moved house that I started to navigate a street in Stoke Newington in a slightly different way because of my new uh, home and I noticed this old sign on a uh, brick wall that was advertising the repair of fount pens and uh, I thought that's remarkable when you know who gets their pens repaired these days and it sort of spiraled out from there and it started off as a as a hobby, you know, I was doing, uh, working in these uh, different roles uh, within the advertising industry and on weekends and uh, days off and the rest of it, I'd go cycling around London, following up leads that other people had sent me. You know, I had a little A to Z and put pins on there and would cycle down to Clapham and uh, up to Highgate and various other parts of London, trying to, to photograph and document as many of these old painted signs on brick walls as yeah. I could. And how, how, how do you define a ghost sign? Well, if, if you really <laughs> want a, a detailed answer to that, uh, you can go and read uh, uh, an essay that I wrote with Geraldine Marshall that's called What is a Ghost Sign? And in, in that, we try to pick apart the various definitions that have cropped up yeah. in written work uh, previously and what we discovered was that there wasn't really a settled definition so we decided to set about constructing one from some first principles so what what's the point of a sign you know what what purpose is it serving is it to direct people is it to advertise something uh, and how is the sign produced is it manufactured out of metal or is it painted um, and through this process of looking at the form and function of different signs we arrived at our working definition which is open for critique of course uh, of fading painted signs and I suppose at the heart of that is this translucent less than full-bodied appearance that you really do get with those old painted signs whether on brick or um, on wood uh, that captures for us that that ghostly aspect uh, that comes up in the term ghost signs. Yes, I, I thought it was that because I, I think all of us, myself and listeners, will have seen them from time to time. You know, you might be parked at some traffic lights or something and you'd be looking up at a wall of an old building. You'll just see some remnants of perhaps an old tobacco company or a brewery because obviously there were a lot of breweries in different towns years ago. Um, and it... it what 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 fascinates me about them is is it sort of conjures up times gone. 
and what was there before. It's, it's, it's absolutely fascinating. That's why that's why I personally find them so fascinating and was delighted that you could come on the show. Yeah. Um, you mentioned a bit earlier on there about um, the um, eth- ethical part of it, I think, earlier. Yes. earlier on. What, can you just elaborate on that, please? Yeah, so, well, this... Um, this really goes back to a, a brilliant essay that a guy called, and I always forget if it's Gozard or Gozage. I think it's Howard Gozage. Gozard is the underwear brand, I think. Um, Howard Gozage wrote this uh, essay, I think, in the 1960s. And he talks about the, the role of outdoor advertising in the world and that when we buy a newspaper or a magazine, there's an implicit understanding that we're going to be exposed to advertising. And we know that the reason the cover price of that is below the cost of production is because those advertisers are underwriting the editorial content that goes into the publication. Same for television and cinema and so on. Uh, But with outdoor advertising, there isn't that implicit exchange of value. You're not receiving anything editorially interesting to yourself but yet you are involuntarily exposed to the advertising and so he he expand he expands on that at length but ultimately the phrase that always stuck with me from that essay was that oh the advert outdoor advertising is is trespassing on our field of vision and i think that really sums up what is wrong Uh, with outdoor advertising and it's interesting to visit other parts of the world where there are much tighter regulations on the amount of space in the public realm that advertising can occupy uh, or the formats that it's allowed to take and um, so that that was I suppose something that that interested me and then I mean you know the the wider stuff uh, you know the the art of persuasion is the old book about you know the the ethical rights and wrongs of advertising at large and the types of techniques that are used and uh, misinformation that can be spread through it so that yeah all of those things interested me but I was you know that that idea of what what is the role of outdoor advertising and is it even legitimate I suppose was was what interested me yeah I can see that thanks for answering that one um so who, who coined the term ghost sign well, I've been doing my homework because <laughs> I, uh, so in, well, in, in our, what is a ghost sign essay, we cite the earliest reference that we cite that uses the term is a brilliant book by William Stage. Uh, it's about ghost signs in America and it's just called ghost signs, brick wall advertising in America. And that was published in 1989. And when we were looking at the essay that we were writing, I contacted Stage and his publisher, uh, Todd Swarmstead at Signs of the Times, and neither of them could really remember where they got the term from, and neither was prepared to claim that they had coined it. So after uh, publishing that essay, I discovered this thing called Google Ngram, and what Google Ngram allows you to do is put in a search term, and it will whiz through the current scanning in Google Books for that term now obviously you know if you put podcast in there it will go back to whenever sort of podcasts started to be a thing and uh, so I I put ghost sign in there and that managed to get me back to an article from 1981 uh, in the historic in historic preservation which is a journal and it mentions a fire in Brooklyn destroying a building revealing on the building next door an old painted sign and it calls it a ghost sign. Now, because I knew I was coming onto this and you had sort of preempted that question, I thought, I wonder if Google Ngram has been updated at all, you know, years, years later since I did that search. And in fact it has. And um, there is now, if you go on the Oxford English dictionary website and look up ghost in its part on you know derivative terms it now has ghost sign in there and the earliest reference that they cite is actually from 1941 oh right and uh, it has uh, a book by oj grisier how to make sign advertising pay now i've been trying to track that down on secondhand markets today because i'd love to just see yeah. that reference but potentially we're talking as far back as the 1940s fascinating <laughs> that's, the kind of, that's the kind of geek I am. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
No, that's 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 marvellous. So I'm I'm pleased that my uh, my question prompted that, and, and I guess you are as well. Yeah. No. Well, now I'm going to have to go and sort of update <laughs> the record, <laughs> so to speak. So where where can Go Signs be found, Sam? Well, in theory, all over the world. You yeah. know, they, they are obviously I started my interest uh, in the context of the UK uh, once I was aware of them and I think that's important is is to, is to become aware of them uh, I went on holiday to France and that is a wonderful country especially in the rural areas for spotting these old signs many of the French roadside ones are for alcohol brands like Dubonnet and Suze and the rest of it uh, the US with its uh, massive industrial heritage um, and advertising heritage indeed is is a brilliant country for them australia you know all of the industrialized world but then you go into other parts of the world i lived in cambodia for two years and you find remnants of old painted signs there and you know there's cultural narratives that are revealed through the signs so for example in cambodia uh, there's a lot of the public information signs to do with health and um, handing in arms, you know, yeah. after the civil war there. So, so these sort of campaigns, government and, and so, such campaigns, Vietnam, you know, we traveled afterwards and you see there the painted signs used for propaganda, um, you know, for, for conveying party political and other messages. Yeah. So it, it truly is a, a global phenomenon. Uh, and one of the, I suppose, you know, it maybe reveals some of my own prejudice, but one of the, the places that I was most surprised to see such an exemplary quality of ghost signs in terms of the execution, illustration and so on was uh, Cairo in Egypt. You yeah. know, I, I would never have thought this Cairo is going to be a hotbed of ghost signs, but uh, Frank Jump, who is, you know, sort of, uh, a brother by another mother, as they say in in New York. He's he's Mr. Ghost Signs in New York. Oh, is he? Uh, he published uh, a brilliant piece on his website uh, from a a woman in Cairo who's been photographing them there, and they're interesting because they have uh, Arabic lettering on them and and wonderful pictorials and huge scale. You know, there's one for Michelin, uh, one for Bic pens. You know, so big brands. Yes. Uh, using this medium in uh, in cairo so yeah in, it's definitely uh, an international phenomenon i suppose the the thing that affects their survival can also relate to cultural attitudes and whether people embrace renewal more or less and uh, you know i get I get a sense that perhaps in France they're more comfortable with allowing a certain amount of decay and dilapidation, uh, certainly in the rural areas. Whereas, let's say, uh, somewhere like Sweden or uh, Norway, there seems to be much more of a movement towards modernization and, and suppressing some of these old uh, remnants of the past. Those are, you know, I mean, those are my perceptions having visited some of these places. So, they're, they're, yeah, they're all around the world, basically. Yeah. And yeah. specifically, you know, let's take the UK, maybe the US and Australia as examples. Uh, the places within those locations where you will find them are normally urban centres. Uh, it's not to say you don't find them in rural areas, as I mentioned, France, but they do tend to be in the centers of higher population for obvious reasons, because yeah. that's where you could reach the most people. Certainly the, the bigger brand advertising uh, examples would be in those places and then you have to have this slightly interesting mix of the area was developed before the real heyday for these which sort of straddles 20 30 years either side of the turn of the 20th century yeah. so the place has to have been built up and developed prior to to them really exploding in their use uh, but then it has to have also experienced a sort of certain period of maybe neglect or um, you know not having a load of investment and renewal happening there so I, I always think of you know in London I always think of a sort of donut of zones you know two to four it's a slightly um, flippant way of describing it but the right in the middle of London the West End and the city you don't find a lot of them because no. those areas have been redeveloped so rapidly and so often that these have largely been lost. Whereas yeah. it's when you get into those 
we used to call them the inner cities. I don't know if that's still a term in geography, but the the inner cities that, yes, were built up perhaps in the late Victorian era, early 20th century, and so would have these painted signs, but then became, you know, say quite run down and perhaps in the 70s, 80s, even 90s. Um, but now because of their heritage, are sort of they've got lots of conservation zones and things that sort of suppress the types of rampant development that might otherwise see the signs lost so uh, so that would just be you know yes they're worldwide but you know in in the industrialized countries those are the sorts of areas that you want to wander around in okay so i'd like to talk about time um so so sort of three questions really in this one is what you know in terms of the very earliest ghost sign that's uh, available to see how far back does it go um how long does it take for a an advert to say become a ghost sign? In other words, mm-hmm. um, if you had something that were, that was put up in the nineteen nineties, let's say for example, and it had yeah. faded, it had been left. Is is that a ghost sign? And the third question was: is is there like a golden age? I tend to think of you know off the cuff probably something Victorian, Edwardian time would probably be the peak of it. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, to, to, to the last question, absolutely. So yeah. um, the the majority of examples um, documented in our book on my tours and, and at large are do come from that the last, let's say the last 10 years of the 19th century. Uh, you know, there's some that predate that, but the yeah. last 10 years of the 19th century. And then the first 10 to 20 years, so, you know, pre, pre-World War One let's say yeah. uh, and you know and and in the interwar years as well but that you know there's a sort of 40 50 year bracket around the turn of the 20th century that seems to have been something of a heyday for this medium and, and there are reasons why after that and particularly after the second world war their use fell off you know is that because of billboards Billboards was one thing. So you had this standardization and yeah. lower costs of reproductions, particularly for the bigger brands. And then for local businesses, the the advent of neon illuminated signs, other fashions in sign signage yes. took over. And then 50s, 60s plastics, you know, you could, yeah. uh, you know, you could get plas- plastic molded and backlit and the rest of it signs. And the hand painted stuff, to some extent, certainly the big format stuff fell out of favor so that that so to answer your last question first yeah. um yeah. To, to the first question when's the oldest well yeah there's something innate i think in human nature about making marks on walls uh you know you look at cave painting and so on we don't know what the precise communicative intent of those were and it certainly wasn't commercial um but there is something about us and our nature that we, we want to leave a mark of some description. And there are, uh, in South Africa, they've discovered little painting kits that they've carbon dated to being 100,000 years old. So the, the, there is wow. evidence of people painting on walls yeah. uh, going a long, long way back. Now, in terms of commercial work, the ruins of Pompeii and Herculaneum are the the oldest surviving examples and there in addition to political slogans and advertising you find commercial work for uh, vintners and even a brothel which has a i guess for the time a quite explicit uh, pictorial piece on it so uh, so yes commercial paint on walls can be traced back as far as that now there's then a huge hiatus that we don't know really what happened. Um, but in terms of the, you know, the relatively recent era, there is an example in Bath in West, in the West of England that has been dated to the 1820s. Uh, so that is, to my knowledge, one of the oldest, you can't call it modern, but no, you know what we would typically think of as a ghost sign so not you know not ancient paint on ruins but it's a it's a, a relatively recent uh, piece of work but that's 200 years old um, and what it what does it feature so that sign is uh 
was discovered or documented by Kirsten Elliott, who, who's written the book Ghost Signs of Bath. And it was revealed under plaster work on a pub called the Porter Pub. And it was once a chemist, and she's now managed to successfully date that to the to the 1820s. That's so amazing. that's uh, 200 years old. And, you know, but luckily it's in Bath, yeah. uh, which means it seems extremely likely that it will be looked after because yes. of the way that the whole city of Bath is a heritage site and so well, on. I was going to talk to you about protection in, in a minute, but one thing I just I just wanted to say, you mentioned Pompeii earlier on. Yeah. Um, and um, I, I read a thing in, I think it was the Week magazine, where they were actually showing what looked like a pizza, a sign that had come from Pompeii, but with a, a pizza on it. Yeah, well, they, you know, they, they have quite, um, you know, quite brilliant pictorial work uh, over there and I, it's it's on my it's on my bucket list of, yeah. <laughs> of places to visit um the, the other question you'd mentioned on sort of time and and the rest of it was you know at what point or how you know how long does it take for a sign to become a ghost sign and you know if, if the, the 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 possible obvious critique of my fading painted signs definition is is what counts as how do you define fading fading because from the minute a sign is put up on a technicality it is fading of course. <laughs> and so uv um, rays and everything yeah. <laughs> so um so you know I, I i think it's it's you know it's hard to pinpoint a um a point strictly they're they're fading from the moment they're created yes but i suppose it's subjective to an extent um but i would avoid any definition that relied on the age of the sign because that is is futile and it's the same as you know why can you go into a pub and order a pint of beer when you're 18 but the day before your birthday you couldn't it's yeah. uh, you how can you some some people say oh go sign is something that's 50 years old well why you know yeah um the the other you know the other definition that some people use which i think has has some validity is based on the idea of redundancy so a sign that is no longer serving its original intent or purpose yes and uh, i think that's quite an interesting way to approach it the only drawback of that is i think it doesn't account for this faded aspect in that you could have a neon sign that's no longer serving its original purpose. So is that a ghost sign? Some people say yes. I personally don't, uh, but that's up for debate. Yeah. So, I'd, I, you know, I don't know how you would, yeah, how you would pinpoint it. I suppose you just, you've got to do it on a case by case basis. But as you say, it's the ultraviolet light that is reacting with, um, with the pigments that is causing them to fade. And yeah. you have some that age in that way. The other type of decay or effect that you get on the ghost signs is where normally it's actually the, the layer of paint under the lettering or picture work that dries out to such an extent that it cracks and starts falling off the wall and uh, and so you get the you get some wonderful patterns at the cracking stage of those um, and the other thing that's wonderful about the the fading of them is where the same wall has been used multiple times for different signs so obviously a big wall in a prominent location would be highly sought after by advertisers. And so you would have a local firm, a brokerage firm that would say own or have a deal with the owner of the building, giving them permission to solicit it for advertising. And so they would go around agencies, advertisers and the rest of it and get the work painted on them those contracts might last for months or years uh, but signs would be put on and painted over and painted over and then as the more recent signs fade traces of those signs underneath begin to come through and, and become more and more visible mm. and sometimes you can have three four multiple layers on one of these a bit like an onion yes. and the term that myself and many others have adopted to describe those is a palimpsest and uh, for listeners who have not come across the word palimpsest before it's borrowed from the study of ancient manuscripts where 
the same vellum or material that was being written on would be used again and again uh, in, because it was expensive to produce. And so yeah. what you would have is someone would have written on it and then that writing would have been scraped or rubbed away before the next bit of writing would go on there. But you never completely got rid of the impressions no. from the old writing. And so over time, you have these layers of text that build up. And it's a brilliantly apt description for this effect that you see on on ghost signs. So palimpsest is a word for the day. That is certainly a new one for me, that's for sure. I shall, I shall look that up as well after the, after the show. Um, yeah, I mean, for, for me, the, the a ghost sign to me, and, and as I say, I've, I've been vaguely interested them, in them. Um, for about 20 years, but not not to the extent you, you are, Sam. Um, it's just that you see it and instantly it, it, it sort of takes you back. It's like a different era. And that, that for me, you know, it doesn't matter how old it is, but 100 years, 60 years old or whatever, that yeah. is a go sign. Um, it's, yeah. it's a feeling for me. Yeah. And and quite and it can be quite literal as well. You know, I, I mentioned earlier the, the the fount pens repaired sign, and yeah. you know there you you really have a, a signifier of a of a different point in time that we are not familiar with. Yes, and yes. there's there's another in South London, uh, very very faint on uh, I think it's on Brixton Hill or Brixton Road, and it's for Craven A cigarettes, and it says for your throat's sake smoke and so you have these <laughs> yeah. you know well i mean a <laughs> tobacco advertising is banned now but yeah. you know think of a time where you could advertise tobacco and you could advertise it with respect to the benefits of yes it on your <laughs> on your throat. as a health benefit it was wasn't it yeah yeah yeah, yeah. there was you know camel i think famously i think it was a u.s campaign actually but that you know theirs was nine out of ten doctors prefer camel and, you know, yeah, it's just all of this stuff, it, it, they really do uh, take you back. And I've always yeah. described them as that, you know, they're windows into the past. Yes, and, yes. Um, and very public ones. They're not sitting in dusty archives. They're right there on the yeah. street yeah. for everybody to access yeah. and enjoy. Do you, do you regard them um, in their sort of where they almost as art? <laughs> uh, I it's, it's a very interesting question. You know, are are painted signs or the work of sign painters art or not and i, I meant well sorry to interrupt but i i sort of meant as they fade as they become the oh, signs, as you they, think, yeah is, is that is that now becoming art do you think i think they are artistic i don't know if i would call them art in and of themselves yeah. they they are they are artifacts um and they are beautiful uh but to call them art, I, f I feel like there, there needs to be some human underpinning, you know, so, you know some human motivation underlying mm. the, their manifestation. And I don't think that is there as such. Mm. Uh, but, you know, what, what definitely is artistic with them are people's interpretations of them and, and photography of them and engagement with them through, uh, through other artistic practice. A lot of people have used ghost signs as springboards into their own creativity and I, I i quite often document work like that on on my blog i think it's fascinating to see how different people have taken this same starting point and used it for you know it could be from watercolors to to printing to to different ways of exploring the theme even to the development of things like typefaces based yeah. on elements of the signs but I, I think my my short answer to are they art would probably be no uh, but i'm not a uh, i'm not an art historian they, they so. i think what you're saying is that they're not actually art themselves but they inspire art yeah exactly as a, as a result of yeah. um so this is the big one preservation of them you know i think we both recognize and most people recognize that there's something special about them and they're beautiful yeah um what first of all in the uk are they is there are they recognized by anybody as having to be preserved so yeah, you're you're right to uh, bring up the geography of this because each different country has its own regulatory system and so on when it comes to heritage and conservation. In the UK, they generally have been ignored by bodies like uh, English Heritage or now Historic England. Although interestingly, they did recently put a post up on their social media about ghost signs, so it suggests that they're 
view might be shifting and uh, maybe my years of contacting them and saying, are you ever going to do anything about these? Uh, could oh, you've done that, have you? Well, uh, you know, I've always contacted them and said, look, yeah. you know, wh- why, why are these things not recognized in your current um, criteria and qualification of what is worthy of listening? Because their whole system is derived from architecture and architectural features and some it does include signage sometimes um but it tends to be uh physical and mounted signage and i think that ghost signs they sit in a sort of limbo because they're not part of the fabric of the original building yeah um they've been added at some later date and are you know, are sort of, you know, are just, they're just commercial. And uh, so English heritage has generally ignored them. The thing that um, is relevant in the UK are what are called local listings. And these are held by councils and recognise things that are of local, but perhaps not national significance. And so, you know, for example, there's a, there's a, there's at least two in uh, Hackney where I grew up um, and other parts of the UK and London, you know, Bath has got, well, but Bath is different because it's, it's kind of got a whole city <laughs> status. Um, and then you have things like conservation zones, which stop the sorts of things that normally lead to go signs being lost. Now, all of this is well and good, but even when something is locally listed, there's not really a lot that can be done if somebody commissions a, a, a sandblaster and and, mm-hmm. and has a sign taken off a wall or paints over it or does you know that the no. the sort of enforcement of it isn't very active and you can you know councils are not going to spend the money chasing somebody who destroyed a ghost sign when they've got a massive list of other priorities so the yeah. thing I have always adopted as my not always, but from quite early on that I adopted as my strategy was at its heart, the people who are going to look after these things and preserve them for everybody are the owners of the buildings themselves. If the owners of the buildings themselves are aware of them, appreciate the value, perhaps understand the history of the specific sign on their building, then they're more likely to to protect them and it's about a shift in mindset from I've got this old dirty thing on my wall that I want to get rid of to Mm. I've got this thing that adds intrigue value and so on to my property and therefore I'm going to keep it you know if you think about someone who's got a Banksy artwork on their wall absolutely no way they're going to get rid of it because they know that that probably adds half a million pounds to their property and the rest so it's about for me educating people and raising people's consciousness of these signs and bit by bit through podcasts like this you know hopefully after people listen to this there might be five new people in the country who have one of these on their wall who are now going to go oh actually i'm going to keep that because when it comes to selling my house or my building that's going to to add rather than take value away so that that's sort of my approach I, I i you know the whole thing of attending council meetings lobbying waving placards the yeah. rest of it i just always felt was you might get some sort of legislation but is it really going to be effective and i think the most effective thing is 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 this way that i describe it which is winning hearts and minds exactly so yeah, you typically absolutely. you you would you would actually knock on somebody's door would you if, if I, I mean do you keep track of where these these are these places are and who owns the house and, or the building i haven't i haven't sort of done that proactively no, no. <laughs> um but full-time I, job I, I would guess yeah but you know i i have um for example i i for many years led walking tours in london taking yes. people around looking at these old signs yeah. and periodically we'd be stopped outside somebody's house and they would open their front door or peer out of their window and say what are you doing you know sometimes aggressively sometimes less so but they were obviously wondering why why on earth are you lot stood outside staring at my house and it it was always quite interesting to see that they often had either never noticed it um, or that they had noticed it but had absolutely no idea what it was and when it came from and you know so there I did directly engage with 
uh, with owners. But I think probably I'm I'm thinking more in terms of you know getting the book out, getting onto podcasts like this, radio shows, and trying to get this thing into the public realm. And you know I, I won't take all the credit, but I definitely feel that since I started writing my blog in about 2007. Um, you know, I do feel that I have played some role in raising public consciousness of these these things. Well, I'm sure you have. I mean, I, I mean, when I was sort of becoming interested in them, and I googled, and your name came up, and hence the introduction. So you're, you're obviously at the forefront of it. Um, I, I was reading about that you did some work with the uh, the National Archive for the History of Advertising Trust. Sam, could you tell us about it, please? Yeah, well, that, uh, I just mentioned my blog. So in, I started my blog in 2007. It was mainly a way of <clears throat> publishing stuff without the, you know, the, the pressure of doing a book. Yeah. And back then, you know, blogging was slightly different. You know, people would follow each other's blogs and comment on each other's blogs. It was a sort of precursor, I suppose, to you know, social media as we have it now. And through that I became a bit of a magnet people started sending me their photos of signs and then it became international and I realized you know I personally can't be the depository for ghost (laughs) signs it doesn't it doesn't work like that and so I knew about the history of advertising trust which is the largest collection of UK advertising in the world and that they're in uh, Norfolk and they have a huge warehouse full of uh, newspaper and magazine and other print advertising and they've got lots of you know videos and they've got huge online archives as well but something I noticed was that they didn't really have anything substantial on this quite interesting piece of advertising history so I, I went to them and I said look if I did it would you host a, a digital archive of ghost signs and they said, well, yes, we would, but we would need to get some funding for it. So I managed to get some sponsorship from Hovis, which oh, is yeah. one of the brands that yeah, you yeah. find frequently on Ghost Signs. Yes. And, um, and then as a voluntary project, uh, went about crowdsourcing through Flickr, uh, a UK and Ireland, we actually added, um, archive. And so that launched – it was a big project. I mean, I, you know, I spent a year on it and – you know, it was categorizing all the signs, getting usage rights to publish it in the archive and the rest of it. But at launch in 2010, so I started 2009, it launched in 2010. And there were, I think at that time, about 600 examples on there. It continues to grow. I'm not involved in it day to day, but the History of Advertising Trust maintains the archive and people can submit their photography to the archive and have it published on their website. Mm-hmm. And I, it's well over a thousand now uh, and, and continues to grow. So I'm, I'm happy that there's a, an ongoing tangible outcome from yes. that. Um, yeah, that's carried on. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, oh, that's excellent stuff. Well, well, we can probably put a link to that. We will put a link to that on the show notes. Great, thank you. Yeah, and a uh, big shout out to the History of Advertising Trust for taking that leap of faith with me all that time ago. Yeah, that's great. Um, and, and your tours. Can you uh, yeah. tell us a bit about your tours? How long have you been running them, Sam? So, yeah, I, in, now when was this? 2013, we'd got back from... Cambodia and I, I was thinking about you know what should I do with ghost signs next and the, the archive was there and I thought you know one of the problems with everything I've done so far blog online archive the rest of it is all digital and it's all people looking at screens and there's a definite tangible difference to looking at something on a screen compared to engaging with it at street level and how it is in the exist in the built environment and how people would have engaged with it back when it was serving its original purpose and yes. i thought well you know there's quite a cluster of these in stoke newington where uh, where i was living and wouldn't it be nice to sort of join them up as dots and take people on a walk around looking at them uh, so that was something that I then spent a lot of time in hackney archives and obviously online researching the history of each individual sign and trying to date them and and finding relevant information about the companies they advertised and started i think i did the first trial one with friends in october 2013 and then 
2015, I added the South London Walk, which goes from uh, close to Borough, uh, close to London Bridge Station, over to near Southwark Station, sort of skirting the south bank of the river, but sort of three or four streets beyond. Yeah. And then um, 2017, I collaborated with. Uh, Roy Reed and the Clapham Society to do one in Clapham that you know a lot of work goes into researching them yeah I bet but it was and and I got you know I ran those until we moved to Spain in 2019 so what's that about six years yes and it is just I, I love that experience of getting people out on the street showing them these signs and really telling the story and and I you know it was rated as I think I got the TripAdvisor Certificate of Excellence five years running or something like oh, that excellent. because of the, the reviews that people would leave for them. Yes. Um, and uh, so that that's – and those tours, you know, we moved to Spain. I decided, okay, well, how can I keep them accessible? And so I digitized them. So I've, I've voice recorded each of the stops. I've put all of the contextual images. So I, I have these laminates that I show people. You know, here's how this wall looked in 1924 so that yeah. you can see how the place has changed. Um, and I've got things that show contemporary press advertising, for example. So I've got all this contextual material. And the clap and walk on my website is free. So people can go on, they can just download that onto their phone or tablet or whatever they use. And you can either, you know, do it in the comfort of your own home through Google Street View. So I provide all the Google Street View links. Yes. Um, or you can download it and go out onto the street with your headphones and actually walk along as if I'm there with you. Oh, you can do it yourself. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So the, the digital ones are... It's just all there. They're audio visual, you know, like you would have in a museum, you know, when you have the yes. the mobile phone thing in, yes. in the museum, they're like that. Yeah. Uh, so that was a way of, of keeping them accessible uh, yeah. when I couldn't deliver them in person. Now, you know, when I'm back in London, I normally put one or two public uh, public walks up for sale but uh, no I've, I'm I'm semi-retired from, <laughs> from yeah. leading them in person the only thing I do do is private ones so if, if yeah. somebody books me uh, to do a whole walk then I'll um, then I'll make that happen but for me the the day-to-day -day promoting of my public walks is is over and how long do your walks take uh, it started as uh, about an hour and a half. And then as I had more and more to say and people asked more and more questions, it nudged up to about two and a half hours. That's an in-person one. Yeah, but if yeah. you do the digital version, it's about an hour, hour yeah. and a half. Okay. And I guess the ones that take two and a half hours, you, you uh, probably stop off at a pub somewhere, do you? Uh, we we try and cram it all in before oh, lunch. Yeah. And then, uh, well, I used, to, I used to offer people the, the, you know, the idea of having a beer or going for a bit of lunch afterwards yeah. but no one ever really seemed that keen on it i don't know yeah. <laughs> maybe they were fed up with me by that point so perhaps perhaps a hovis sam hovis sandwich at the end or something yeah <laughs> yeah but uh no i mean you know two and a half hours i think is probably pushing the limit of what people can do without a bathroom break yeah and then the um the third thing i wanted to ask you about which was on your website is your book um ghost signs a london story which you, you brought out fairly recently so this was, um, yeah, published in 2021. And as you can imagine, from from the beginning of my interest in this, it was always at the back of my mind. You know, there's a book yeah. in this. And I mentioned William Stage's uh, Ghost Signs Brick Wall Advertising in America uh, from 1989. And that, uh, you know, is still one of the definitive publications on the topic. The My work prior to the pandemic was majority events based and that came crashing to a halt uh, with the arrival of COVID-19 and so I reached a point towards the end of 2020 where I was a bit a bit of a low ebb actually and not really very optimistic about what was going to happen next and I thought well what I just need to do is throw myself into something get get myself busy um, and, and do something. And I had, when I, I keep a list of sort of one day, maybe projects, you know, sort of, yeah. if I win the lottery, what would I do? And, uh, one of them was, was write the ghost signs book. And the thing that I suppose had always held me back was my photography, because although I get lucky sometimes, uh, my photography isn't 
professional and was somewhat patchy in terms of its coverage of London, especially. And I, I thought, you know, the, the, the place to center a book is London. And I gave a phone call to Roy Reed, who I collaborated with on the Clapham Walk and have known for a long time yeah. and said, Roy, you know, he, he is a former architectural photographer. And I said to him, Roy, look, I want to do this book, but I think it's going to need your photos or at least the majority of your photos to turn it into the kind of publication that I would feel proud of. And yes. he's retired and he said, yes. So then it was sort of, okay, now, now you've Excellent. got to do it. So yeah. we spent the next, let's say eight months, you know, researching, there's more than 250 signs in the book, but we probably researched 300 or more, um, which then whittled down and was edited to the final cut. Uh, so yeah, so we, we probably researched something like 300 signs in total, but that got whittled down to the just over 250 that are in the book. And the way the, and then, oh, well then, okay, so then we were thinking, okay, how are we going to get this published? Because we'd basically written it, uh, but we didn't have a publisher. And we had approached some of the, the likely suspects, but they had all said, oh no, it's too niche and blah, blah, blah. And so we were sort of determined to do it ourselves and we're going to put it on Kickstarter and go that way. And a friend of mine said, oh, well, if you're going to do Kickstarter, go and talk to Max. He's done a load of books on Kickstarter. So I gave this guy Max a call and he runs a small uh, imprint called uh, Isola, Isola Press. And I had a conversation with him, which was initially to pick his brains on how to do a Kickstarter. But he turned around and said, you know, would we be interested in doing it in partnership with him? And for us, that was just a no brainer because we then suddenly had his expertise on, well, yes, the Kickstarter side, but also in, you know, all of the production and distribution and the rest of it of the book. Uh, but it meant that uh, with him and with Eve, who was the brilliant designer that did the book, we were really close to the process. So we, you know, it's not that we had full control, but we were able to, you know, have a lot of input into how the book was structured. And it's quite technical parts of it because each sign, so there's there's a load of introductory chapters that cover things like we've talked about today. When were these painted? How were they produced? Uh, should they be preserved and protected? How are they lost? All of these themes are covered yeah. in the six or seven introductory chapters. And then the rest of the book is thematic by uh, the types of businesses. So there's dressing the city about clothing and shoes, and then there's entertaining the city about newspapers, cinemas, and so on. So that, that's how the book is in feeding the city. And in each of those chapters, the signs that are featured each have their geolocation. So where are they? You know, so we would, we'll, we'll say it's on this street uh, at the corner with that street or on this street between these two streets so that you can pinpoint them uh, when you want to go out and find them. Uh, it's got the, uh, the, the company or companies that appear on them and then a little sort of potted history so each one has got you know in, in effect i mean some of them are very extended uh captions telling you the story of them and then finally and this is I, all credit to roy who can see things on faded walls that i can't but we transcribed them so we've written uh the actual text oh, right. that appears on the signs there are a few gaps but yeah in honesty by and large they are all all transcribed and then at the back of it you know, this is a 320 page book. At the back of it, you have various indexes. So you've got the signs and company index, you've got the thematic index, um, you've got image credits, and then uh, you've got my favorite, which was a very, very late edition, uh, was uh, signs by postcode. And so oh, this is where, if you, you know, give me a postcode in London. <laughs> SW11. SW11. So let's have a look. SW11, not bad. So SW11, one, two, three, four, five, six signs in our is, book are from SW11. And you is can that Clapham quickly. from memory? Uh, whew, let's have a look. I think is Clapham not SW4? 
SW11. Let's have a look. 55, it says on here. But anyway, so the yeah. book is um, is our sort of magnus magnus opus or whatever you say. But it, you know, I I was really it exceeded all my expectations. And um, it looks here. Okay, SW11 is this one. Battersea. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It looks like, and uh, yeah. oh, that's a lovely one. National News and Sunday Evening Telegram. Um, so yeah, so uh, the book was published. It, well, we did a we did do a Kickstarter. We uh, we we raised enough money to get it into print on there, and it's still uh, it's still available. People can go and buy it. It's twenty five pounds, and uh, you can get it directly from the publisher. Um, or we recommend people order it from their local bookshop. Try and support independent uh, businesses rather than the uh, the mega online corporations where you can. Well, we'll put the link to those on on the show notes. Yeah, Sam, that's great. So, if there are any listeners out there who, you know, they actually they're, they're sort of quite interested and inspired after hearing this conversation, yeah. what advice would you give them if if they wanted to search for them? Well, I mean, you can search if you want to look online, then obviously that's easy. You can just, you know, Google ghost signs, you'll find my website, my blog and the rest of it. But I think really you want to get people out onto the street looking at these things. And um, so I think that the key stuff is to is to 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 locate your your search. So, you know, you're not going to find very much in uh, an extremely rural area. Uh, You're not going to find very much in a very modern uh, part of the city um, or you know a very developed part of the city uh, so you need to get out into those places that were were, de- were developed before that heyday that I described at the turn of the 20th century so where mm-hmm. there might be particularly old industrial locations um, you know close to mills and rivers and canals those are often good places to go to go hunting um, but probably most important is just how you engage with the street itself so you're not going to find many of these signs at eye level no. they're typically up on the first second even third floors of buildings so you need to start walking around a little bit with your head in the sky uh, while maintaining consciousness of road safety and Absolutely. dog mess and, and those yeah. sorts of hazards <laughs> yeah. um but yeah so look looking up is important and also you know and i do this on my i do this on my walking tours is check your blind spot because as you approach a building, you might not see anything, but then when you walk past it, it's always worth just glancing over your shoulder and checking to see if there's anything on that wall. And yeah, Victorian buildings that were built in the Victorian era are are some of the best. And if prime, people prime suspects, yeah, and if uh, I mean obviously we did the book in London. One of the things we did to accompany the book was uh, was a map, and so there is a an online map. Uh, which people can find on the page on my site about the book. And that has, oh, crikey, I think it might be 750 or 800 locations in London. So if you think we've got about 250 in the book, where there's actually more than triple that that we're aware of in London at large. And so if people want to go and find some little clusters uh, in in London, then uh, then that map can guide them and there are other maps in the world there's one for san francisco i believe there might be one for melbourne somewhere Uh, so other people have have created these maps there's one for glasgow i believe Um, so you can you can use those as a as a a starting point but Mm. i think it's really it's get out onto the street and and tune into the frequency that's what i talk about on my walks you need to tune into the frequency of these things to figure out where they are in the in the built environment because once you are i assure you that you will start to notice them almost everywhere that you go oh that's that's great advice sam so i mean are you do you think that there are a lot more ghost signs that lie undiscovered oh gosh yes mm. <laughs> you know i think the uh, well, going back to the definition, um, the, the, one of the approaches to defining them is that the, the re- well, this this starts from the point of view that the reason they're called ghost signs is that they often appear and go boo when a building is demolished. Yeah, yeah. and uh, it's quite an interesting 
approach to it. It's not the definition I would necessarily choose, but that's another way of thinking of the ghost bit of them. Um, but something that appeared in the process of research in my book, especially looking back at historic photos of sites where known ghost signs are, is how many of those locations subsequently had a billboard put up. So like I said before, the same wall would have been painted multiple times because it was a prominent wall with high footfall and the rest of it. Yeah. And so you can imagine that when that transition to billboards happened, it was prime site for putting up a, a printed billboard. And so lots of the signs exist because they were protected for a long time by billboards. Un- underneath a billboard. Yeah. So it, yeah, so and it is very interesting. There's one on my walk in Stoke Newington that was revealed from under a, a bit where well, it wasn't a billboard but a signboard in about 2011, and it was quite legible at that point. You could really clearly see all the different elements and the little shadows on the letters and the rest of it. In the intervening what now 12 years, it's faded considerably, and. Given that it was painted, I think, in the 20s or 30s, that signboard and perhaps others before it have played a big role in preserving that sign. And so it's a a bit of a a double-edged sword in that these things that obscure our view of these old signs are at the same time ensuring that they will survive into the future. So I think in terms of existing billboards and newer buildings i think there are you know thousands certainly uh worldwide to be revealed and one fi- one final question sam which which you just sort of sparked off there we mentioned earlier on about preservation and and um you know getting organizations and people to be aware of them in that sense but also the sense of you've just mentioned there about the fact that they're preserved underneath something if there is a particular ghost sign that um is very prominent are there are there any methods of actually preserving it physically yeah that's that's a good question so the obviously one of the challenges is that they're not so easy to <laughs> take off and put in a museum in the same way that you can with a book or a, a document it has been done you know in in the US the American Sign Museum has a handful of painted signs mainly that have been painted on wood uh, buildings uh, that they've removed and and kept and put on display um the the things that the people do well one is is perspex coverings and that generally is used to protect the signs from graffiti or you know or other forms of in inverted columns criminal damage yeah um the other would be to in some way arrest the decay so you know for example applying a varnish or something over the sign uh, there's a number of issues with that because one that varnish will will yellow or discolor over time which will affect the colors of colors of the sign itself Um, but the other is that you are then you know you're almost asserting a this is we want to arrest the decay here at this point in time, uh, which why why shouldn't it fade a bit more or, or so on? So you're, you're, you're starting to intervene with the course of nature. Now, I it's funny, I, I personally, even though I'm very passionate about them, I tend to adopt an uh, what's the, what's the word uninterventionist or like a you know I don't adopt an interventionist approach to them I tend to talk about letting them age gracefully probably because I'm slightly desensitized to them because I've seen so many and I'm aware of so many but I can see how you know when there's one that is sort of personal to oneself or that is representative of a particular locality that people will be passionate about wanting to keep them and and preserve them and one of the things that lots of people do is repaint them so you you see lots of examples of where uh, there's been a an arts project or a heritage project that is to bring back the full-bodied brilliance of the original sign and these projects are in ghost sign circles quite controversial um, and often have been done badly um, 
without reference to archival materials and so on. Uh, the thing that I have seen done, which is sort of kind of a halfway house, is when certain elements start to fade to invisibility, is almost just to, to touch those bits up while retaining the overall faded aesthetic yes i think that's that's quite an interesting and novel approach but i suppose a long way around of saying i personally wouldn't touch them but what i think is important is photographic documentation i think that getting good quality photography of these signs and telling their stories is is a is a prerequisite for any kind of preservation or conservation work and what i would love to see and this is what english heritage slash historic england should be doing is beneath significant ghost signs having little plaques not like the blue plaques that you see you know saying so and so lived here but like a little informational plaque that's almost like a page from our book that shows you an old photo of how the sign used to look tells you a story about the sign dates it and gives you information maybe there's a qr code on there that takes you to a web page that lists it but you could see suddenly having something at street level that encourages people to look up and to appreciate the history that's on their doorstep uh, i think would be a wonderful initiative for for someone like english heritage or a local heritage society to to take on yeah no that's that sounds quite exciting if something like that could be done um do you have any more projects coming up sam well all of this um ended up segueing to me uh, becoming fascinated by contemporary sign writing or sign painting practice so uh, the the work i do at the moment is publish a magazine which is all about sign painting it's called blag better letters magazine and uh, in that there's there's a regular ghost sign corner feature <laughs> so, so i've shoehorned oh so th- uh, this is your magazine yeah so i have yeah. a print print and online publication called blag, blag. and yeah. um yeah that, that has a, a healthy dose of of ghost sign content in there so that that's my sort of main focus at the moment the the follow-up book if i ever get round to it uh maybe we need another pandemic no please don't wish for that um but no the follow-up book if i ever get round to it uh will be ghost signs a global story and you know whereas we did ghost signs a london story the idea behind this book is that we pick certain locales in the world that have a particular story to tell in terms of the type of signs found there or their attitude to preservation or um, d- different facets, like I mentioned Cairo earlier, you know, different facets of ghost signs that are revealed in different geographies. So that would be uh, the follow-up book. It sounds like um, a good way of incorporating a holiday. I'd ha- I would certainly <laughs> need to, to, to budget in some yes. uh, some long-haul flights to, to far-flung places. Yeah. <laughs> but, so, uh, but- yeah, go on. Sorry. Where can people find out more about your work? My website is ghostsigns.co.uk and on the about page there you can find lots of the, the frequently asked questions and uh, a whole host of useful links, many of which I've discussed today. Uh, that's probably the, the main place. I do periodically go on Twitter at ghostsigns and on Instagram at Mr. Ghost Signs, uh, and I'm always love to see uh, pictures that people send me. I'm less active blogging and on social media these days, uh, but I still like to bang the drum for these these fascinating pieces of local history. And, and if you've got any listeners that have, think they found something quite special where they live, anywhere anywhere in the world, um, should they get in touch with the National Archive for History of Advertising Trust? For the History of Advertising Trust, if it's in the UK and Ireland, then uh, they can. there's a submissions process. There's a couple yeah. of forms they need to fill in and they can send them there. Uh, I recommend joining one of the Ghost Signs groups on Flickr, which is, uh, is a good place to, to upload photos to. Um, if there's something that is, I don't know, newsworthy in a sense, like, I don't know, a sign under threat or a sign that's recently revealed, um, you know, do send them to me. I, I, I am still interested in them and can give advice and suggestions of people to contact about them. But yeah. as I say, I, I you know, day to day, I'm not an activist. 
Um, but uh, I always love seeing photos of these old yeah. signs. Well, Sam, this has been a really great conversation. It's been interesting to learn more about ghost signs. And I certainly think that, that I will be on the lookout for more of them. And I dare say our listeners will be too. So my guest today has been Sam Roberts. Sam is author of Ghost Signs, A London Story. And you can find a link to Sam's website on the show notes. Thank you for coming on the show, Sam. Thank you, Bob. An absolute pleasure. You have been listening to Undercurrent Stories. I hope you enjoyed this episode. Please feel free to share the show link to your friends and family. And if you have 60 seconds, I will be most grateful if you would please rate and review. To hear more episodes, please subscribe to the show and visit undercurrentstories.com. If you leave your email in the link, we will notify you as soon as new episodes are released. Also, check out our social media links, details of which can be found on the show notes. Until next time, this is Bob Wells wishing you all the very best.